Welcome to Blaze the Trail podcast, bringing you authentic and vulnerable stories that will inspire you to breathe fire on this world and become your own hero. Here's your host, Blaze Hunter. Hello, welcome to Blaze the Trail podcast. I'm Blaze Hunter, and I am a fertility expert. No, I don't help people get pregnant. This is a different type of expertise. I actually inspire women to birth confidence and business ideas, to birth their books and dreams, passions and goals, as well as discover peace amongst infertility. After going through my own sets of traumas and tragedies, dealing with a rare disease and experiencing three miscarriages, I decided to take charge of my life and not let life happen to me, but rather become the hero of my own life. I am not barren. I continually birth my purpose every day. So that's why I've created this show, to demonstrate how even though we all experience setbacks and disappointments, we still have a destiny to birth. We just need to blaze the trail and be expecting. This podcast will inspire you to lean into your hardships and allow them to be the vehicle that transports you into becoming the hero of your life so you can breathe fire on this world. This week's episode is called what's in a brand and some points we'll cover are why is it important for people and businesses to effectively brand themselves and why should you care what are the benefits to branding and marketing is it worth the money and how can businesses survive this pandemic with branding skills and i have my friend here and candido here to speak on this topic and is the founder of Go42, a brand love building consultancy aimed at developing unexpected yet authentic connections to people's heart, mind, and soul that will help more people hopelessly fall in love with your brand. A 20 plus year veteran of Procter & Gamble, Anne has been a thought leader and architect in game changing product launches like Secret Clinical Strength, as well as pivotal brand and business building programs like the London 2012 Olympic Thank You Mom campaign and the Cannes award winning Tide Super Bowl campaigns, Bradshaw Stain and Tide Ad. What she discovered is that it doesn't matter the size of your business, how many people you employ, or how long you've been around. The common thread that runs through all successful businesses is that they intentionally cultivate brand love. Now she uses this insight and her fine-tuned processes to help all businesses dig deep to discover their untapped brand love potential, creating dramatic business impact. Her clients range from musicians and makers to creative and tech agencies to startups and small mid-sized businesses. Anne resides in Cincinnati, Ohio with her husband, Tony, and their blended family of four adults in training. Anne believes in the power of being connected in mind, body, and spirit, and that grit is the secret to success. Welcome, Anne Candido, to the show. Well, thank you for having me, Blaze. This is so awesome. You're into branding and marketing. I'm a branding strategist. It's awesome to have two like minds to share and just dig deeper and peel back those layers and really talk about some things that people may not understand with branding and marketing. And I think it's great topics for anyone going into business or in business. And it's great to have you on and discuss this today. I'm excited to be here and discuss those topics because I totally agree with you. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about your bio just there, but really kind of explain your background with branding and how you're so passionate about it and what made you come to where you are. Sure. You know, I started in a little bit of an untraditional path. I'm actually a mechanical engineer by background. So uh, I started um, at one of the companies that some people will consider the birthplace of brand building, and that's Procter & Gamble. Um, billion dollar, multi billion dollar uh, consumer products company. Often they sell the products all over the world. So, uh, the likes of Tide, Olay, uh, Bounce, Old Spice, all those fabulous brands I'm sure tons of people have in their, uh, their homes. Um, and I spent my first 10 years actually in product development. So, I really learned the upfront piece of how do you make a product. And I worked very upstream in that um, in, in, within product development, as well as more of the downstream working packaging, as well as uh, consumers, consumer research, or really identifying what consumers want from their products and really translating that into design criteria. And then after the first 10 years, I decided, you know, I, I really want to be closer to the business. I feel like I have a bigger impact um, to make on the business itself. And that's when I actually went into communications. 
um, starting in some of the, the programs that you had mentioned, doing more of our uh, P&G-based communications, but then um, spent my last seven years in fabric care. So some of the brands I just mentioned, like Tie, Downy, Bounce, Gain, um, Unstoppables, and, and really cultivating those brands and, and, and helping not only new brands uh, emerge in market, but also brands that have been around for a very long time continue to stay relevant. And that's when I, under, I, I started to understand that, um, like you said in the intro, that the common thread really tying these brands who have longevity is this common thread of brand love. They really invest and they spend a lot of time in uh, cultivating brand love. And that's really what defines a commodity from a brand and then a brand from a franchise. And once you kind of get that insight, you kind of see the potential that uh, it emerges. And that became my job was to realize that potential for those brands. After 20 years at P&G, I decided it was time for me to, uh, to do my own thing. And I really wanted to take that, that learning, that insight, uh, and, and basically break it down to businesses that may not understand it fully. Um, because as we were talking you know, before, you know, that it, it, it's, it's a kind of an ambiguous concept, brand building and marketing. And so I wanted to make that more tangible, make that more actual, because it can absolutely be a business strategy for businesses. Totally. And I think there's been a big shift in how we've done business in the past. We have social media, there's instant, there's tons of flooded information and brands and businesses flooded people every single second around the world. And we're going to have to shift how we used to do business. And I think a lot of people, because we don't understand maybe technology, we don't understand these new waves, these new products, these new inundated messages that we we shy away because we don't understand so maybe let's just say like explain why is it so important for people to care now more than ever about building your brand well 90 percent of decisions are emotionally led that is like an insight that a lot of people don't realize but a lot of branding and marketing or at least what people naturally conceive as branding and marketing especially in the advertising realm like what you see in commercials is very product benefit led Right. But once you have established a product benefit, that's great. And that might get you off the ground, but that's not going to sustain you long term. So what you're going to need, you need to do is you need to continue to create and forge relationships with your consumer that keeps your relevancy alive, keeps you top of mind and keeps them coming back to you. And now because the world is actually very big, but also very small in a lot of ways, it can be very overwhelming and daunting to figure out how to do that. Like you said, social media, it's the thing, right? It's, it's what people feel like they need to do, but without like an appropriate social media strategy, everything you, you, anything you do could be like throwing dart to the dark board with like a blindfold on you. And, and that's where a lot of businesses get in trouble is because they don't have a strategy that's led from consumer insight that allows them to make good decisions about how to connect with their consumers. And that's what I've spent a lot of time doing. And actually it's, it's, it's the, um, the, the, the core of my, the book I just wrote, the super high rate of relevancy, getting more people to choose your brand more often and definitely where I explain a whole entire process for how to think through how to make those connections. So you can figure out where you should play um, and then how to continue to build out and cultivate that into long-term growth and success. Oh, love how you just said that. I love what you just said there about strategy because I find when you do branding and marketing well, it looks easy and people don't understand the work behind the scene that got it there. And it is a strategy. And so many people in businesses think, you know, these are outliers where, you know, people in business take off by chance and you hit viral. And we all think we can do that without spending the money or really having that strategy. We think we're going to be that one it business that's just going to take off by posting one thing that's inspirational or something, right? But it is about marketing and branding and effectively positioning your business that way. And it's not a waste of money. So what, what would you say to people that don't quite understand the strategy behind it? And, and, and what do you tell them that, that, that there is a benefit to this? Yeah, I really just ask them, how long do you want to be around? I mean, do you, do you want to be a Nike 
Um, or do you want to be like a one hit wonder and fizzle in a few months? Because if, as long as you're going to live in the world of commodity, you're going to be vulnerable because other people are going to come around and they're going to create a better widget than you. And they're either going to figure out how to position it better than you, or they're going to charge a cheaper price and totally undercut you. And branding and developing your brand is the only way to differentiate yourself in this space and create a unique uh, connection to the consumer that only you can own. And until you're willing to do that, which takes investment, and it's, it's all, it is investment of money, but it's also an investment of mind space that a lot of people find very difficult to do. And that is I, I, what I find is one of the biggest uh, barriers for, for businesses wanting to uh, invest is that they just don't have the mind space in order to be able to do that thinking. And uh, that's really, really the key. Is and, and the way I tell them it too is like, you know, if you if your pilot were to get on an airplane, right, and say, you know what, I think we're going to go to Atlanta. I'm not exactly sure how we're going to get there, but that's okay, right? We're just going to kind of figure our way out. I mean, or like an athlete was just going to like, you know, a runner was going to go out there and just say, you know, I want to make the Olympic team, but uh, I think I'm just going to go run a little bit and, um, you know, see how it goes, see how I feel. Like, no, everybody has strategy. Anybody who's wanting to succeed and to build and to grow and to persevere has a strategy. And it's not any different for your marketing strategy. If you do not have a marketing and branding strategy, you're basically flying your plane out of flight plan. You're trying to become an Olympic athlete without a training schedule. So it, it baffles me that people feel like they can just put a couple of social media posts out and it's going to, you know, do just fine. Or, you know, if it doesn't do fine, they're not exactly sure why, but then they think it's a waste of money, right? So it's like this virtuous cycle that they get themselves into, which I then I think brings down the whole uh, importance that they find for marketing and branding. For sure. I, I, yeah, I like how you're explaining it there. And, you know, it, is, it, it isn't tangible. It's not like um, you pay this amount of money and you get physical things back. Sometimes um, branding and marketing has different pockets of reasons. You're doing it for, you know, community awareness or brand awareness, or you're actually advertising a product, or you're doing something for a different result. And sometimes it's a planting of a seed and it's not immediate return on investment. Maybe it's six months down the road, but it did pay off for you. But it, that's the the tricky thing with branding and marketing confusing for people is that you don't see immediate exchange of, you know, paying out, getting back. It is a process. It is a work in progress. And we need to tell people like, it's about risk too. You're sometimes you're going to, you do one and it, and it doesn't work. That mean doesn't mean marketing is a fail. It just means that one idea, but don't put all your eggs in one basket and keep trying. Right. <laughs> You're exactly right. I mean, this is not a science. It's an art. And you manage the art by testing and learning. And you test and learn strategically and judiciously by having uh, kind of your, what I call your, your key performance indicators or your measurables or your analytics that are closer in to what success looks like for you. So like you said, if you're, if you're wanting to see growth in the next nine months, obviously there's several steps of what must be true in order to obtain that growth. And you need to back it down from that and say, okay, what's the first thing I need to do right now in order to have an impact on that growth nine months from now? And then you, you develop a, an, a, key, a KPI right around that point so if it's like if you have a, a store and you're like, I need to have 10 people come into this store a day, right? So then what do I need? Well, maybe a flyer will work. Well, and if you could try different marketing aspects that are not that expensive just to see if you can generate any kind of um, a shift in, a, a, in an immediate thing that you can see that's going to lead actually to your longer term growth. So it doesn't have to be so daunting if you can kind of like back it out and, and try a few things, kind of see what's kind of moving the needle, and then you invest in it. Then it becomes something that becomes a longer term you know, strategy and plan. But you're totally right. Like it, you may sometimes see, not see the dividends for nine months, and you have to be okay with that. But you, it doesn't mean you don't know if you're being successful for nine months. So you, you have to kind of find the creative ways of making it tangible. And so if someone is listening now and they're like, hey, I, I've heard branding and marketing, but now you're really building on a, on a love brand. Maybe explain what that is. Mm -hmm. What do you do with building a love brand? 
a love brand is a brand that is emotionally connected to the consumer in a way that transcends its basic product benefits. So one that I talked about and I think I kind of mentioned early on was Nike. So Nike, at the end of the day, they sell shoes, they sell shirts, they sell shorts, they sell a commodity. But when you don those shirts and those shorts, you believe you're an athlete. They don't sell shoes and shirts and stuff like that. They sell the fact that you want to be an athlete. They sell being an athlete and that emotional connection that comes with that. And that's why they've been able to dominate. It's not because necessarily they have the best shoes and they have good shoes and, you know, but Adidas has good shoes and, you know, um, you know, Reebok has good shoes too. It's the fact that they sell an emotional benefit that a, a consumer connects to that has more tangible value than the basic product benefit. And when you can figure out how to do that, you can charge higher prices, you get more customers, you can scale more quickly, you can generate more impact. So building a love brand is all about connecting to the consumer in that emotional way that you create and that creates authenticity that only you can, you can own. Oh, yes. And so that's the creating that connection. And I always say I'm selling a feeling. I don't talk like salesy. Mm -hmm. I'm selling how passionate I am. And people feed off of that. They literally are. This is proven. If you're passionate in what you're speaking, you don't have to be like only for $9.99. You don't have to speak like Correct. that. It's, you know, it's coming from a place where you're passionate and you're emotionally connected to what you're doing. And that invokes a feeling in them that they come to me afterward and they're like, I don't know what you're selling, but I'm buying, right? Because you've connected to yourself and you've connected to them. And so it's a, it's very, a lot of the pathways being all connected to your passion and your values. And that, that's what a brand is. And we have to get people and businesses to find that, right? It's exactly right. It, and actually to your point, is if you were to say it only costs 99, they'd be like, um, now I'm not so sure. They expect those things to cost more because they have more value, right? So it, it's also, you know, a different place to play. And that's what takes you out of the commodity world. And you're right. That is what people want. And it's not just millennials and Gen Zers. I know a lot of people say that that's a millennial thing. It is not. You know, and the reason why is, again, because 90% of decisions are emotionally led. And as well as the fact there's so many choices out there that, of course, we're going to gravitate to something that means something to us, means something more than just a basic product benefit. And I can tell you from working for seven years on Tide, I mean, Tide at the end of the day is just a laundry detergent. Why would you pick Tide? I mean, it's, it's, it's the best laundry detergent out there. Great. But I can tell you that, you know, even though it's the best laundry detergent, only four out of ten people that you would talk to are buying it. So if everybody knows it's the best laundry detergent, and I can tell you about nine out of ten people would tell you that it is, there's five people who say, like, ah, I get it's the best, but you know what? It just doesn't matter enough to me to buy it. So if we want that brand to grow, we have to figure out a different way to sell laundry detergent. And that's really the core of how you persevere, how you become, you know, you create the longevity, how you create something that's going to systemically continue to uh, to reinvent itself as consumers change um, and as, as point of view change, as the world changes. Otherwise, you stay so static, you become irrelevant, and you can't then adjust to the way that the world changes. Oh, absolutely. So let's banter back and forth about some of our favorite branding tips because we want to break yes. this down, that it's simple. You don't have to go out and spend $30,000 to create a brand. It's, there's, there's some simple steps. Just take one step and build, right? So I wanted to kind of have you break it down a little bit in some of your favorite maybe branding tips for businesses in, in anywhere and in any budget. Yeah, so the very first thing to do, and this is work anybody can do. I don't care what size of the business you are. I don't care how long you've been out there. This is the very first thing you should do. And if you haven't done it yet, you need to do this. And this is to identify your consumer. And who is your most opportunistic consumer? Not everybody in the world, because I know like that's what everybody likes to say. They like to say, oh, we, we appeal to everybody. Great. But you can't talk to everybody. You can't talk to everybody at once. Because then you become nothing to nobody, right? So you need to pick one consumer that if your business was like, going to die tomorrow and you could go only go talk to one person and that person was going to be the key to unlocking your business who would that person be like what what kind of gender would they be what kind of demographic would they be what kind of sociographic what do they enjoy where do they live like understand that consumer in an intimate way and then understand what is really bad for them right now in the context of what you sell 
there's, there's definitely a tension there that you need to really uncover and figure out what, how that makes them feel because that is where your emotional connection is going to come. If you can figure out who your consumer is, what's the tension for them right now, and then how does that make them feel as a result, you've uncovered your purpose. You've uncovered a reason to be able to connect with that consumer in the only way you can, and then the rest becomes figuring out how you're going to do that. So my very first brand tip is to start with those steps, and anybody can do that. You just have to carve out some time and be really to be honest. And understand that business doesn't like grow because you are able to talk to everybody all at once. Your business grows because you start to mean something to a specific group of people that are going to become ambassadors for your brand. Oh, you say it so beautifully. And I, I totally agree upon that. And then also like, can we talk about like, you always hear, you know, tradition and you've built this business and it's been going for 50 mm -hmm. years. But I think like we have to understand we, it's important for us, like you had said before, you have to be able to be changing and not stagnant. So growth, but also adaptable, mm -hmm. right? And I think sometimes we get right. humans in nature, we're very stuck in our ways. And if it's worked and we're still in business, then why not continue what's been working? But I don't think that's the right angle, right? <laughs> Right. And usually it doesn't sustain itself like that because your consumer changes, right? So, yeah, so I think some of your business can continue to grow based on reputation. And there's a word of mouth um, quality that, you know, tends to help uh, businesses sustain themselves, um, you know, year upon year. But the world changes so quickly now that you can't lull yourself into a false sense of security that it's not going to change or somebody's not going to come, you know, forward and just totally annihilate you tomorrow. So you have to be aware and, and, you know, get, you know, not stick your head in the sand and plan for that and, and be bullish about how you're going to establish yourself so that nobody can come in and, and take this from you. And that's not saying that it, it couldn't happen or might not happen, but you know what, I, you, you, it's going to happen <laughs> if you don't shore up your, your, your weaknesses and you don't like, con, you know, continue to build a, um, an equity that means something to people. And, you know, for example, um, you know, restaurants right now are, are really hurting, right? With everything that's going on from uh, a COVID-19 standpoint, restaurants are really hurting. But the restaurants that are getting the most amount of uh, attention and, and support from the communities are ones that um, have personally connected with their patrons in a way that those patrons don't want to see those restaurants die. They just don't want to see them fold. They don't want to see them go away. That's a creating an emotional connection based on an experience, not just the quality of food, but based on the experience that means something to people's lives that makes them want to invest and make sure that those restaurants don't die despite what kind of fear is, is out there. So th that's really critically important, especially in today's day. Oh, yeah. And then like how you had mentioned before, being connecting with your consumer. Um, I think because there's so many things happening in every day, I see like, oh, I can help you do this and I can help you build your email list and I can help you do this. And then mm -hmm. people get inundated and overwhelmed and they are trying to be Nike and maybe they're mm -hmm. picking the platform that's not best suited for them. That's not connecting themselves or connecting to their consumers, right? So we can't be Nike. We have to be us and hone in on our power and our emotional connection in order to succeed with your consumer, right? Yeah, I, I call this the super highway of relevancy. I mean, not just because it's the title of my book, but it's basically the analogy I want people to internalize is that you need to build your own superhighway to your consumer. If you continue to try to jump on somebody else's superhighway, let me tell you what, they built that highway they know those routes. They know exactly how it's going to be. What's going to happen is you're going to get stuck in a traffic jam and you are not going to be the one that emerges at the end. So even though it looks like, you know, if I just follow Nike's plan or, you know, insert, you know, brand, that's the fastest way to what I want to achieve. It's actually slower. And you're more apt to get onto like a, into a traffic jam and not be able to move or have to take a detour because it's been so slow and you have like no money left or you have no time left. So it is really important to create your own highway. It's harder. Yes, but it's not, it, it, it has the reward at the end of the day that is going to belong only to you. And, and that is so, so critically important to invest into your business in that way. Yes, 
And like I help my clients and I always talk about my five P's to success. I uh, came up with your pain is your purpose because we always have to be cyclical. We always have to be regenerating new things. We can't just stay in one for growth, right? You can be successful in one area, but you still have to grow so you're not stagnant and be adaptable. And so whether it's your pain, like emotional pain, or it's a problem that you want to solve, there's many problems that are coming up every day that we have to solve. So focus on what you can solve, not somebody else's problem or pain. Like, what is yours? Mm-hmm. What do you want to solve, right? Because that creates passion and that emotional connection. Yep. And then you pilot an idea from that. That's the second P is like, you've got the problem. Now, how do you create a piloted idea, a solve, right? And then you're only yep. as good as you. You need to partner. You need to create ex- like effective partnerships outside of your circle that you can expand that reach. And it just creates more business, more promotion, more exposure for you, creating these amazing partnerships around the world. But then you've got to effectively promote it because it stops at the partnership if you don't promote it, right? (laughs) And then you get all the way to the fourth P, promoting it. And sometimes, like we said, not all ideas are going to work. You have to keep pressing on. You have to keep trying. You don't just stop at a setback. You have to push through that in order to survive and thrive in your business, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, amen, sister. I mean, that is exactly the process I outline in my in my own book as well. And I think the important thing, you know, to the point you were making before, too, about like the email campaigns and the newsletters and, you know, and, and whatever you're going to pilot it's always important to ask yourself why you're doing it. What is your outcome that you expect to achieve? And I take that back to the what must be true in order to generate that impact that you want to generate. And that is at the core of the the strategy what becomes. Because like you said, the you know, the the purpose is so critically important, but then you have to figure out the narrative that's going to actually convey that purpose mm-hmm. in a way that is going to have consumers like really understand, um, hit that relevancy, hit that authenticity. And you may need storytellers in order to do that. Uh, I call these uh, the brand love vehicles and the brand love vehicle has three components. It has a storyteller, it has a narrative and it has a channel. And those three things need to work harmoniously together in order to transport whatever your purpose or your message is to your consumer and those need to be crafted. And that's where people really break down, I think. And that's where they feel like the money suck is, but it's a money suck because you haven't done the other steps (laughs) and you need that guide, that strategy, right? In order to be able to uh, strategically think through, well, where should I start first? And then understand, okay, well, that didn't work to your point. That didn't work. So how do I refine that? Um, in order to make it better or do I, or that one just didn't work and I need to go to the next one, but at least you have a strategic process in order to walk you through those options versus just like, eh, Nike has social media, I'm going to do social media, or, you know, this company has like a newsletter, I'm going to do a newsletter. I, I just continue like that. And you need to ask yourself why, what is it going to pursue, you know, on behalf of my, my business, what is it communicating you know, is it communicating? Is that the way my consumer actually wants to receive information? Is that where they're going to be? Is, and that's the channel part. Like, when are they the most receptive? How are they the most receptive? Make sure you're communicating to them when they want to actually hear from you. Because otherwise, it's, it's, it's useless. Um, that's where you get stalled on the, on the superhighway because you're trying to go through a, a rainstorm or a thunderstorm and you don't have any windshield wipers on. So, um, you know, it's, it's really, really important. Everything that you said, I totally agree with. Oh, yeah. And like, like you had mentioned, a money suck. And I think people then think, oh, you know, I, you know, I can do it myself because they may not fully understand the back work of it. Right. Like, oh, yeah, we don't if we aren't a handyman, we're not going to go fix our car. We take it to a mechanic. And that's an easy thing for us. We take it to the mechanic. But yet when it comes to our businesses, which is so closely to our hearts, it's, it's our blood, sweat, and tears. It's personal. And yet we won't go higher or seek out advice. We think we can just do it. And I really caution people, like, ask for advice. Like, ask people. You don't even have to pay money to even get advice. You just make some calls and get some, you know, intel on how you can properly position yourself, right? Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. Um, I, I, I use a very similar analogy, too. I'm like, you know, if you were building a rocket, 
you know, you're not going to say, I can build that rocket myself. I don't need anybody to help me build a rocket. But I think the reason why people feel marketing and branding is different is because it seems so much more accessible, right? Because you Mm -hmm. see commercials, you see social media, and people don't understand, um, and a lot of businesses don't understand that in order to do it well, you have to have it very uh, cohesively strategized in order for it all to make sense. It doesn't just happen by happenstance that a post resonates with you. If somebody has thought about the strategy of connecting with you in a way that you want to be connected with, and that's what makes it resonate. But people feel like, yeah, I can make a social post, right? I can, uh, you know, because they see it all the time. But you're right. Like, we wouldn't think about trying to, well, some people try to fix their own car, but it's the same thing with, like, websites, you know? It's like, because that is so accessible and easy, everybody's like, I could do a Wix site. I mean, you just put, you know, or, you know, put some blocks here and put some blocks here, and then you put it up. But there is a quality factor to really consider. It's like, okay, what kind of quality is going to signal back to your consumer that your brand has the equity that they need to under, you know, to, to see, to buy you and to purchase you? Because if you have a half-ass um, website out there and you're trying to sell a premium product, people aren't going to believe that you are walking the talk. They're not going to believe that you like have a product that's premium if your website is not premium. So those are the stylistic things that are so incredibly important to consider. And I think that's where people get in the trap too, is they see those those price tags and they're like, oh, I can do that. I I don't need somebody to do that for me. And either they don't have the time to do it well, they don't have the expertise to do it well, um, or they don't understand the full extent of what it takes to do it well. And, And it just doesn't turn out well. But on the flip side, I have seen a lot of brand marketers and agencies take advantage of people. So I understand there's a lot of fear out there, mm-hmm. but you can get through that fear by knowing, and like you said, yeah, you said calling some people who, or who actually know what they're doing and ask them, how do I vet an agency? How do I know this is the right agency for me? And I go through a couple of these things in my book too. How do I know this is the right agency for me? How do I know that I'm not going to be taken? How do I evaluate work? How do I know it's good work? You know, and you need to really do your homework and understand who can advise you appropriately in order to do that. And uh, that's critically important because there is a lot of fear out there. And I've seen businesses um, being taken advantage of, which is why I focus a lot on small and mid-sized businesses now, because I feel like they're underserved, but they're so core to our economy. uh, And they have so much potential and they want to learn and they want to do big things. And it's just so much fun to work with them. You know, you're totally right. And there is everywhere you go, no matter what pocket you go into, there's the risk of getting taken advantage of. And that's why we always say, like, don't throw all your eggs in one basket. Do testing, constant testing. Do a little bit. Mm -hmm. Take a little bit of a risk. You're not taking huge, but take a little bit to see and test. And is there something worth? And, like, I'm just going to allocate a little bit over here and some attention over here and see what's going to come back for me and and see if I enjoy it. And, And another thing I think people get a lot lost a little bit because we see all these celebrities now, all these big names on social media, doing podcasts, doing things, branding themselves, and they're using their their phone and it's all wiggly and videos and they're getting millions and millions of views. So then it kind of creates this false sense of like, oh, I can have a jiggly video, whatever. They can do it. Why can't I? And I'm like, but Mm -hmm. you're not, you're not Brene Brown. You're not Will Smith. Like we're not there. And unfortunately we're not. So unfortunately we do have to create a little bit better product because we're not that brand name, right? We're not that big of a person yet. So we need to be smart and have strategy and do try and create as best quality of product that we can afford. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right on. And that really goes back to the stylistically, those, those important things. And, and, and I see people overlook them all the time, to, exactly to your point, because they are, referencing, again, um, brands that are in a different stratosphere than what they yeah. are. Um, and, you know, you have to be able to, you know, make sure that whatever you're putting out there is authentic to your brand. It, it may be okay to have a wiggly jiggly video if that is authentic to your, your brand, mm-hmm. but you better make sure that it is or else somebody's going to see that and say, mm, yeah, I don't think that that is like, you know, walking the talk. And, 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 and so you have to make sure all of those things add up to uh, your, 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 whether it be your packaging, if you, if you have a product or your service, if you're a service, 
I mean, all those things matter. If you are boasting that you um, are, have great customer service, you better have great customer service. You better be going above and beyond to create a customer experience nobody else is, is creating in order to be able to really claim that and, and use that as a differentiating principle. Because I don't, I don't see anybody who says, you know what, we have a really good product, but we have really you know, bad customer service. That's okay, right? You know, nobody's going to go out there and say they have bad customer service. So if you're going to tout that as being a differentiating factor, you better be very different in the way that you achieve that. And that's not going to be by having, like, an automated, like, person um, on the phone when somebody calls in and having seven buttons that they have to choose in order to find somebody to talk to, you know. So you have to make sure the experience and what people are visually, you know, seeing all through all their senses actually connects back to the what you're claiming is your differentiating factor that is going to make your brand resonate more than any other brand. Totally. And I love all all this conversation. And it's not to, you know, tell people they're doing bad because they're trying to do it themselves. It's educating the importance of building this and not disregarding the branding marketing aspect. Even if you have a fabulous product that goes hand in hand. And I think that's what we're trying to do here is help people, help solve their problems, help them succeed. And that leads me into the next question, which we talked a little bit before about um, we're in a pandemic. Things have totally mm -hmm. crashed for our world as we know it with business and how we proceed. And we're going to have to have a new game plan, a new strategy to make us survive. And, and I wanted to maybe ask you, what is some different or unique marketing suggestions you have for this particular time for businesses needing to survive and wanting to push through and, and still have a business coming out of this? I think it's really re, re looking at how you're currently communicating with your consumers and you're going to have to find new ways of doing that. And you do that by all the things that we were just talking about, by really understanding who they are, figuring out how, what you, you call it, we call it detention or the, uh, the problem. What, what are you going to solve for them and what's the emotion that's you know, tied to that and really sell them the emotion of that and figure out the best way then to reach them as a result of that. And that's going to be uncomfortable for a lot of people, especially, you know, the mom and pop shops who may have been so used to, you know, being able to communicate one way and now you have to do it uh, a different way. And so you're really going to have to go back and relook at what is working, going to work for you in this new world and what's not going to work for you. And if you're finding that, like, a lot of the, you know, previous marketing strategies you've used are obsolete, um, you're going to have to uh, – forge new ones, or your business is not going to survive. Because um, we just don't know what it's going to be like day to day, um, or month to month, or even year to year. And, you know, things could, you know, totally write themselves and kind of be, you know, close to normal in the next couple months, or it could be in the next couple years. So I really stress, like, don't wait, um, because there's going to be a new normal, as everybody talked about. Um, and uh, you're going to want to be at the, at the forefront of that. I, so that's, I think that's, that's going to be, um, that's going to be critically important is how do you forge these new con connections with your consumers? I also, what I'm seeing a lot too is that a lot of people are pulling back on their marketing budget because of an uncertain future, not sure, you know, what profits are going to look like. And that's always a, you know, a, an easy place where it appears to be an easy place to cut. I totally get it. I'm not telling anybody, like you said, how to run their business, but then what's going to become critically important is that the personal brand of the people that you have who are facing your, your business is going to have to be stronger. They become your marketers um, in, in essence. Um, one of the, you know, I've been talking to a lot of lawyers, for example, and they have a, a big prominent way that lawyers connect and build businesses is by networking. Um, the lawyers will, you know, do dinners, they'll do um, you know, uh, happy hours, they'll do, um, you know, all these events can't do that right now. So they have to find new ways of communicating in a way um, that's not as direct as that. And what becomes critically important is that your personal brand it represents the, the, not only the firm of which you represent, but how you want to, uh, people to talk about you. Because that's gonna, what's going to be now, uh, you know, the word of mouth is what's going to be the most popular way for people to understand who you are. Uh, and that's going to be what help you get your recommendations and your clients. So I would say then the, the second thing would be to uh, really um, be thinking about your personal brand and how that's going to be a marketing engine uh, for your either your personal business or how it's going to connect with everybody else that's working within your business to ladder up to your business's brand identity. 
Oh, fantastic. Like I could talk to you forever because it's so exciting to just (laughs) pull that out of each other. And because I think we both have a passion for that branding capability that we want to see people grow. We don't want to see businesses fall. Like you have a, you have a passion, you have a, a unique ability. Let's just hone in on that so we can all succeed. There's, there's more than enough room for all of us to succeed, but we all have to do, you know, the proper work, the strategies like we talked about, right? (laughs) Exactly. It's not going to come to you. You're going to have to go get it. And that's really what my, you asked me about my passion. That's my passion. I love to see businesses go get it. And I love to help them to achieve that potential that they didn't even realize that they had. Awesome. Let's recap what we talked about today, the importance of building a love brand, tips on how to effectively market and brand yourself, which includes connecting to your own product and connecting to your consumers, Um, just really having that strategy to go forward and being adaptable and open to change even in this current situation that we're in and how to survive this pandemic by continuing to build our brand and press on. Thank you so much, Anne, for coming on the show today. You have a new book out you mentioned before and you help people brand themselves and build that love brand how can people get in touch with you to to talk to you about that yeah absolutely you can connect with me in two, uh, through two uh ways so you can reach me just directly via email at ann at ancandido.com you can go to my website ancandido.com and connect with me there you can also order my book there you can find me on linkedin um that's where i i generally um post a lot um and uh, share my blogs out on that so and then also um i have a, a, a co-founder um of a uh, on demand we call our demand marketing and branding agency called forthright people so you can also find us uh um, through our website of forthright people and we can help your business uh really get uh adjusted to this new world Um, through on-demand marketing and branding services. That's fantastic. Yeah, I really recommend anyone that's got a business, thinking about building a business, talk to someone, talk to Anne, you know, talk to someone in your circle. We're only as strong as, you know, as our our passions and what we're connected to and in our community. So let's build that. Let's try and build a good foundation so we can survive and withstand different challenges in our businesses. And that's all including with the marketing and branding. So thank you so much, Anne, for educating us and sharing your passion, your wealth of knowledge. And I know you've, you've helped so many businesses and that's amazing. So thank you so much. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Awesome. That's it for this week's episode. Challenge yourself to be vulnerable, lean into those difficulties and have those open conversations with yourself and others so we can rise up as our own heroes and let us breathe fire together. If you've enjoyed this show, please subscribe and support Blaze the Trail podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Blaze Hunter. You've been listening to Blaze the Trail with Blaze Hunter. To learn more about how you can breathe fire and unleash the hero within, or to listen to past episodes, visit blazehunter.com.